Greetings, my brothers and sisters. This is Pastor Smith of the First Congregational Church welcoming you back to Disciple Talk, the Bible teaching outreach of the First Congregational Church. You know, we thank God for you and your attendance in our Bible teaching uh, through our outlets on our YouTube channel, on our website, FCCRaleigh.org, and on channel 22 on Spectrum Cable Channels. Uh, on every Thursday at 8 o'clock. Our desire is to spread the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ on, in biblical discipleship in the Raleigh area beginning at Congregational Church. And as pastor of this church, I believe and pray that our congregation and those in fellowship with us, we will light a fire in Raleigh among churches, pastors, and leaders to reinvigorate ourselves, uh, reestablish, reprioritize the great commission of going into all the world and making disciples. This is our prayer for our own congregation, as well as to inspire others to be faithful to fulfilling the great commission. So on Sundays, I'm in a three, I've preached three part series already, part one, two, and three, on the title of the priority of the Great Commission. I would like to continue to work and teach under that theme of the Great Commission found in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. But today I want to zero in on the very uh, aspect of our Christian walk that begins our walk as disciples, that begins and initiates the Great Commission's efforts in bringing people to Christ, and that is the gospel. Today I want to teach on the gospel. I've done, I dealt with it Sunday in the sermon on Sunday, and I want to deal with it in the Disciple Talk Bible study. So what you will see happening in our church Christian education is you'll hear on Sunday a sermon on the Great Commission, and then you'll hear on Wednesday in Disciple Talk Bible study a further explanation and more biblical uh, explanation uh, in more detail and teaching and explaining uh, on the same topic. I believe that the pulpit should have a con continuity with what we're doing throughout our church life in ed education, Christian education. We should have a systematic approach to proclaiming and explaining the word of God, so that people can get not only the sermon on Sunday, the preaching primarily and teaching, but the more explanation through Disciple Talk Bible study for further understanding, clarity, and explanation. So that's what we're doing today. We want to continue under the theme of the priority of the Great Commission, and I want to deal with in detail today the issue of the kingdom, the gospel rather, of the kingdom. So in Matthew 28, 18 through 20 for our purposes today, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey or observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, we can't emphasize enough the priority that the Great Commission should have in the church. And as I've been saying for weeks now, the church exists to carry out the Great Commission. This is the marching orders of the church that the risen Christ gave to the first leaders, the 11 apostles, the 12 apostles of the church to begin to implement when the church was born on the day of Pentecost. And they immediately began to implement the Great Commission. But where does the Great Commission begin? It begins with the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. It begins with the gospel message because that message is what leads people to be saved and then begin the pathway of following Jesus in discipleship. Now, 
This is important to understand because if the gospel is not proclaimed, if the gospel is not the doorway to beginning to follow Christ in a saving relationship, what you have is people becoming religious, but they're not born again. Let me share with you why that's so important. Go to Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Now, when Paul was writing the church at Rome, listen to what he says about the gospel. Because again, the point is the gospel is the most important message that the world can ever hear because it is the initial message from the kingdom, from King Jesus, that we're to be witnesses of that leads people to true salvation. Let's look at Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation, to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also from the Greek. This is important to understand. And this is an area of spiritual warfare in the church, especially in pulpits and teaching. There's always an attack on the gospel to distort it, to move its primary emphasis away from what it should be on to reduce its importance in the church, to contaminate it with other issues in society or integrate it with other issues in society. L let me say something. Paul said in Romans 1.16, first, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not going to cower back from telling the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes it. You see, this is why the gospel is so important. The gospel of the kingdom is so important. It's because it is the message from the kingdom of God about our Savior King, Jesus Christ, and what he did to save us from the penalty of our sins. See, that's what the gospel is. For the verse 17 of Romans 1 says, for in it, in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. See, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So how are you going to have the, know the, what's right? What's, what is the righteousness of God? It's in the gospel. Now, why is it in the gospel? Because the gospel is the message about Jesus Christ, the Lord the righteous one. You got to get that. He is the end of the law to our righteousness. He is the righteousness of God. If you want to find the source of righteousness and justice and truth, it's in the personification of Jesus Christ. Thus, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of this gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation. It is the very dunamis. It is the very dynamite. It is the very explosive power that the Holy Spirit backs up to bring people to believe through belief in Christ to salvation. The gospel is the doorway to salvation. And this gospel is the gospel of King Jesus, the king of this kingdom, and he is the righteousness of God. And that's why it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. If any person is in Christ, they are a new creation. That's what the new birth is about, as we learned in John 3, that the Holy Spirit regenerates a person spiritually from spiritual death to spiritual life when they believe the gospel message about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as our only hope of salvation. Now, the first point in this teaching on the gospel of the kingdom is that the gospel is the most important message that you and I can hear. 
Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. In the Great Commission, when it says go into all the world and preach the gospel, go into all the world and make disciples, guess where it begins? It begins with the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Christ, the good news. So I hope you understand that as a Christian today, as Christians today, as Christians, no matter whether you're a pastor or whatever your role is in the church, in leadership or whatever position, in terms of who you are in Christ, we're all responsible to share this gospel. And this is important because I believe this is the most important thing we should be doing in these last days. When the church is trying to be a social entity, when the church is trying to be a political entity, when the church is trying to represent cultural trends and priorities, when the church is trying to uh, uh, make all these other issues more uh, or prioritizing these issues more than the proclamation of the gospel, you're heading the wrong way. Because I want to be clear on this. I want to drill down on this. We got to take me the rest of this time, this time with you today. Jesus didn't come to die so that the result of his death, burial, and resurrection, that the object of it would be us in regard to our living some type of better life down here on earth. Listen, hear me well. He came, as he said in Luke, to give my life a ransom for many. See, see, he came to die to pay a ransom, the price that it would cost to redeem us, what? From our sins. See, that's why in the book of Acts, you hear about them saying, be saved from this perverse and, and sinful generation. When you go to Acts chapter 2 and see the first message that Peter preached after the church was born on Pentecost, after the church was born in Acts 2, 36, listen, therefore, this is Peter talking, therefore let all the house of Israel know truly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ both sovereign ruler and Messiah. And then he says in verse 37, and when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Here's what Peter said in verse 38. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the promise is to you, to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord God will call. Verse 40, and with many other words, he, Peter, testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Hear me well. The purpose of Christ's death and resurrection, the gospel-centered message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God dying for us, rising from the dead, is to save us from our sins. That's what the gospel is all about. Now, when, when you try to make the gospel something other than that, when you try to make the priority of the gospel some social issue, some political issue, some personal preference, some racial uh, kind of personality or something in which you think that's what the gospel's here to promote in some sense of its being this primary message. Listen, Jesus did not die to promote your, your, your political agenda, your social organization, your social preferences, your all these other things that people make the gospel today. That's why we call things a social gospel, a prosperity gospel, all this kind of stuff. It isn't no such thing as that. There's only one gospel, and this is the primary purpose of it. You can hear a message about King Jesus, the one who came into this world, the Son of God, to die on a cross so that you could be forgiven of your sins and you would not be penalized for your sins by being sent to hell. That's the gospel. To save you. From what? Your sins. 
to save us from our sins. See, that, that's what it all is about. They said, he will come and save you from your sins. See, and when you miss that, when you take the message of the gospel and put it on something else, you are distorting the gospel. And thus, people are diverted from the way to true salvation and think Jesus came for all these other issues before he came to save you. No, that, that the gospel is he came to save you from your sins. Now, I, I want to really be clear on that because when you personally go out and share the gospel with other people, you don't need to tell them, Jesus is going to make your marriage better. Jesus is going to give you money. Jesus is going to bless you with this and that. Listen, I don't know what might happen after you're saved, but the gospel is about saving you from your sins. I hope you understand what I'm saying to you, my brothers and sisters, because it is important in these last days that the most important message we can share is the gospel. And it is not about all these other things that we think are so important. It's about saving people from their sins. This was the message of the early church, Acts 2, 38. This was the message of the early church. This was the message. Listen to Peter again. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. See, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And, and when that message is distorted, we're dealing with what we talked about in Galatians on Sunday. Galatians 1.3, where Paul said, even if an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than what we have preached to you, let them be a curse. Let them be damned. Listen, listen, listen. For the church throughout world history, Christian history, people have died to make sure the gospel was kept pure. You know, you have people out there running the street now ready to die for their cause, ready to die for uh, social equality, ready to die for racial equality. They're out there doing all this stuff that's so important to them. They're ready to give their life up. The church must be willing to give our life to make sure that this gospel is the primary message that we keep telling people. Because there is a spiritual battle to suppress the gospel, to distort the gospel. Now, let me tell you why this is important. The gospel is a message that comes from another kingdom. This is not a worldly message. See, that's why it's not political. That's why it's not social. That's why it's not cultural. See, the gospel is a message from another kingdom that can have an impact on all those other entities in this fallen world, but it begins with saving people, not trying to improve society. See, the gospel is not a message that says society is going to be improved. It's a message that says you can be saved from your sins. See, and this is an issue of spiritual warfare because as, as Paul is saying to the church of God at Galatians, don't, don't, don't distort it. Don't distort the gospel. Look at Galatians 1.6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert, want to dis disrupt, want to uh, change the gospel of Christ. Now, where does this desire to want to change the gospel come from? It is a satanic influence to try to take the greatest message the world has ever heard about their salvation and change it to something else. It's, it's always been there since the day the church was born. You remember the church conflict early in the book of Acts when you had the Judaizers saying, not only must you believe on Christ, but you got to keep the, the, the Judaic law. You got to obey the law of Moses. You got to be circumcised. You got to follow all of the traditional rituals of Judaic Judaism if you're going to be saved. And the response of the Jerusalem council back then at the early church was this. Look, what we want you to know is you've got to believe on Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. See, 
that's the key to people coming into the, the salvation of Christ. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel plus nothing. The gospel not integrated with anything. The gospel not mixed with religious traditions and rituals. It is what Christ alone did on the cross through his death, shedding of his blood for forgiveness, rising from the dead to uh, approve and validate his reality of the Son of God, the Lord of glory. And it's in belief in that that we are saved. And this is why in Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, you hear those famous words that you've heard over and over again. Here it is. It says here, Romans 10, verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and be, now the Lord Jesus, you got to confess him as Lord. Not, not just some man, not some good person, but as Lord, kudio, sovereign ruler. The Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Why believe in the raising of the dead? Because it is the validation that he is who he said he is, that he is the Lord, that he is the son of God. He was risen from the dead. He bodily was risen. His physical body was risen and changed and, and raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit to validate that this person who was in this body is the Son of God, as he claimed when he walked the earth in the flesh. As people said, we beheld his glory, his miracles, his power, his majesty, his divinity as he walked the earth. And his death was to atone for our sins. His resurrection was to validate everything he said. So you must Believe, you must confess with your mouth that he is Lord. And then you must believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, how are you going to do that if you don't hear the gospel? How are you going to hear that if you think the gospel is about your social benefit, your civil rights, your racial preferences? If you think the gospel is about getting you these things, that is not the gospel. Now, the gospel can have an effect on that, but you don't put that in the gospel. Listen to me. You must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. It says your salvation is based on that. It got nothing to do with no social issues. It ain't got nothing to do with no civil rights. It ain't got nothing to do with no racial issues or some political preference. It got nothing to do with that. Simply confess that he is Lord, believe that he was risen from the dead, and the text says what? You shall be saved. Hallelujah. Then it says in verse 10, for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. Because here it is. Remember back in Romans 1, 17, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Here you see it right here in Romans 10, 10. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. And the righteousness is Christ. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. What you believe in your heart going to come out your mouth. That's why we are witnesses. We tell what we believe. Look at verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is rich over all, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Now, I want to say something to you. Certainly God gives leaders to the church who are to proclaim the gospel, but every Christian has the responsibility of sharing the gospel in your personal walk with Christ, wherever you go. So my brothers and sisters, I want to give you a few points here. First, the gospel is the most important message the world will ever hear. Secondly, the gospel of the kingdom was the primary message of the early church. Third, the gospel of the kingdom 
is always under satanic attack to be distorted, reduced, or ignored. That's why you got to get it right. That's why when you personally sharing the faith, your gospel with people to be saved, you, you don't tell them you get saved by going to church. You don't tell them to get saved by pulling up their pants and stop smoking, stop drinking. What you try to tell believe. Believe what? What he did for you. That he died. That he rose. That he is the son of God. That he is the Lord of glory. That's what you tell them and leave it alone. Don't try to make people get saved by doing some external work. The work was accomplished on the cross by Christ alone, and they must believe it. And that's why we got so many people in the church, they're religious, but they ain't saved even yet. Because they think they are right with God because of something they did. I stop this. I don't do this. I do this. I tie. I do. Listen, none of that saves us. I can't say it enough. What saves us is to believe on Christ. And then once we believe on Christ and start growing as Christians, that works that we do, the works that we do are a consequence of our salvation, not what saves us. As it says in Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. He's not ours. We are his workmanship created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand, before the foundation of the world. So the doorway to salvation is the gospel. The first step in the Great Commission is to preach the gospel so people will believe it. The result of salvation is to be spared from the consequences of going to hell because of our sins. And everything else in our Christian growth and discipleship is a consequence of salvation, not the source of our salvation. I hope you get it. And the last two points I want to make is this. The proclamation of the gospel will determine the end of the world. For it says very clearly in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel shall be preached, this gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 24, 14, shall be preached in all the world as a witness and to all nations and then the end shall come. That's why this message is so important. It determines the end of the age. It determines the return of Christ, the rapture of the church, when the end of things will begin. My brothers and sisters, the priority of the Great Commission begins with the priority of preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This is Pastor Smith. I hope this helps you. I hope this puts you on the right track if you're off track. And for those who are faithful in preaching the gospel, keep preaching the gospel of the kingdom, for it is the only way to salvation and to glorify King Jesus. God bless you. This is Pastor Smith. We'll see you next week on the next Disciple Talk Bible Study.